Hello and welcome to this latest Lowy Institute live event. This is part of what we're calling the Long Distance Lowy Institute, in which we communicate our content and analysis online while we're unable to do so in person. A very warm welcome to everyone joining us from Australia and to, and to those dialing in from overseas. My name is Michael Forleylove and I'm the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. I'm delighted to be here for this very special Lowy Institute live event with General Jim Mattis, former US Defense Secretary and Commander of US Central Command, and one of the most storied generals in recent American history. Also joining us today is one of Australia's most highly regarded military leaders, Sir Angus Houston, the former Chief of the Defense Force and one of my board members at the Lowy Institute. General Mattis and Sir Angus are old friends as well as colleagues at the Cohen Group. Since General Mattis resigned as Donald Trump's Secretary of Defense in December 2018, he's been very discerning about the events in which he's agreed to participate. So I'm grateful to General Mattis for agreeing to join us today and to Sir Angus for helping to facilitate. This event is part of the Lowy Institute's project on Australia's security and the rules-based order, which is supported by the Australian Department of Defence. Earlier this week, the Institute released an interactive timeline illustrating how Australian governments have spoken and acted in relation to the rules-based order. I encourage everyone watching to visit the Institute's website and explore this feature. Now, some brief housekeeping before we begin. I'm going to chair a conversation with General Mattis and Sir Angus, and later I'll put some questions to them that our audience members submitted when they registered online. So welcome, General Mattis and Sir Angus. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you, Michael. Good to be here, sir. General Good to be Mattis, here, I'm Michael. Thank you. I'm going, to, I'm going to ask both of you a bit about your upbringing and how you got into your, how you started your military careers. I'd like to start with you, General Mattis. You grew up in Richland, Washington, in a bookish household without a TV. Tell me a bit about your upbringing and how it is you came to join the US Marine Corps, one of the, the most feared fighting forces in human history. Yeah, well, uh, Dr. Michael, it's like most things. Uh, we make our plans in life and God laughs. Uh, I grew up hiking in the mountains, enjoying life here on the Columbia River. Uh, we're a little bit south of British Columbia, but in the dry side, the semi-arid side. So probably like many of your people who enjoy the outback, we enjoyed the outdoors here in our region uh, at the time. 18, conscription was still a, uh, a reality in the U.S. forces and U.S. society. And without a whole lot of reflection, uh, I decided to uh, do my service for a couple of years in the U.S. Marines. Uh, that leads naturally to, well, how did that go from a couple of years to over four decades? And uh, it was just, uh, I found that I didn't like a lot of the jobs in the Marines. I grew to hate minefields at a very young age. Uh, but I absolutely fell in love with the sailors and Marines, those rambunctious young lads in the infantry uh, who would crawl into minefields looking for something they didn't want to find. Uh, and I, uh, I just stuck around for the pure joy of, uh, of serving alongside such, such uh, I'd call them selfless and high-spirited uh, uh, young men. It was the infantry. Uh, it got its name, infant soldier, young soldier. They were all young, very young, uh, young men, basically. So that's, that's the story of my life in a capsule. And General Mattis, you described your childhood as heaven on earth, but in your 43 years of service in the Marines, many of the places to which you were deployed from Iraq to Afghanistan and many other places could hardly be described as heavenly. Let me ask you, what was the toughest assignment that you were given during your military career and which job did you enjoy the most? Um, well, I, I enjoyed most being an infantry second lieutenant because there's no, there's no gap between you and your troops. You're right there in the mud alongside your sailors and Marines. And uh, that's also uh, the rank when I first met Australian soldiers uh, and found a, a like-minded crew there, I might add. Uh, but I think that uh, the job that was probably most difficult was, was the last job I was in. It's, I, I find it a lot easier to actually go into the, the, uh, the brawls than it is to order other people to go into the brawls. That's, uh, that's a lot more difficult in its own way. Uh, different uh, different skill set, 
and not one that is as rewarding in the sense of you're, you're testing yourself against what you're sending them into. Uh, you, you got a little bit of remoteness there, and it's not, uh, not, not the most redeeming kind of job. All right, I'm going to ask you about your time as Defence Secretary a little bit later, but Angus, Sir Angus, let me bring you in because you had a different journey. You were born in Scotland, I recall. You applied to the Royal Air Force initially, but I think you were told you were too tall to be a pilot. Thankfully, the Royal Australian Air Force wasn't so picky. So tell us a bit about how a young man from Scotland ended up having such a distinguished career in the RAAF. Well, it's, it, it's interesting. Um, actually, the people who did the uh, cockpit check didn't know how an ejection seat worked. Uh, I would have fitted, but they didn't know you had to lower the seat to the lowest position um, to adjust the ejection seat. So I guess a mistake was made. Uh, I came to Australia. Uh, I decided I'd go out on the, uh, the land. Uh, and uh, the second year on the land, I was share farming and uh, we had a very bad drought. Uh, and uh, I went broke and joined the Royal Australian Air Force. And from there, I never looked back. And interestingly, I discovered as soon as I got into flying training uh, that the ejection seat works by you get into it and you adjust it downwards, not upwards. <laughs> and I fitted perfectly. Well, I think Australia owes a vote of thanks to that uh, recruiter for the Royal Air Force that um, mistakenly told you you couldn't uh, join the British Armed Forces. General Mattis, I want to ask you about alliances. You've often quoted a line from your time in the Marines, when you're going to a gunfight, bring all your friends with guns. What's your view about how America's alliance system works and how it furthers the interest of the United States? I think uh, you have to put it in a historical context because for its first 150 years and more uh, as a republic, uh, America tried to, was shying away from alliances. Mm -hmm. And after World War I, the world had changed, uh, but we still kept that tradition and it still tugs at us today. It is still, it is still an aspect of the American, uh, the American view of the world. But the greatest generation coming home from World War II, uh, having gone through a global depression, having been through a horrible war, uh, tens of millions, uh, we don't even know within 10 million how many died in the war, so many died. It was somewhere between 50 and 70 million. Uh, and they said, what a crummy world, and whether we like it or not, we're part of it. And out of this comes the United Nations, uh, which was the uh, effort to have a place where we could talk and try to keep peace and prosperity online. Uh, Bretton Woods, uh, Bretton Woods 1 and 2, you and I know it as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. So when people were losing hope, uh, they didn't have to turn to a, a fascist named Mussolini. It was actually a lender of last resort to get wealth generation going again. Uh, we saw it with the Marshall Plan. And then I had something the Australian ambassador to uh, Washington DC taught me. He said, and America made the single most self-sacrificial pledge in hi world history. Uh, I thought I knew something about American history. I said, oh, you mean the, uh, the Marshall Plan? You know, it's where we hope you said, oh no, he said, uh, that was just an example of America's generosity after being the victor in a war that they had actually escaped a lot of the costs of. He said they, uh, no, he said the most generous thing, the most sacrificial pledge made was after World War II, they could have looked at Europe and said, that's twice in 25 years you've drawn us into your war, something I think Australians too could feel to a degree. And we're turning to Asia, to Latin America, to Africa, but you're on your own with the Soviets. We're, we're tired of you. He said, instead, you pledged 100 million dead Americans in a nuclear war to protect democracy in Europe. It took a foreigner to teach me that, the Australian ambassador to Washington, D.C. So it was out of that reality that the greatest generation said, we have got to be part of this world. And from that point on, the rules-based order uh, became exactly what we aimed to promote and protect uh, with like-minded nations. We couldn't do it on our own. That was a going-in assumption. And since then, it's worked so well that some people have forgotten 
that you need to tend to it. You need to nurture it. You need to protect it. You need to adapt it. But that's, uh, that's where the alliances came from. And uh, uh, when you have, like in our case, 100 years of mateship, uh, in many cases, you actually have something to build on already. So it's a matter of continuing to build. It's a matter of continuing to show respect and listening to your allies. Uh, something we uh, occasionally need a reminder about, I might add, like today. Well, tell me a bit, you, you alluded earlier to having some experiences with Australian servicemen over the years. Give us a little bit of colour about that, if you wouldn't mind. What, in what circumstances have you dealt with Australian officers and service men and women, and what's been your experience? Yeah, uh, in over many years, uh, we deployed into the Western Pacific, the Indian Ocean. We've trained alongside each other. And one thing that really stuck out for me was the Marines being a naval force, we cannot solve problems with mass. We, we're not the U.S. Air Force. We're not the U.S. Army. And so we actually find similar problem solving uh, with your size force, where the individual's initiative and, and uh, their skill is what you rely on. You're not going to rely on, on mass. So it was always at times a, a heartening experience to serve alongside your guys because we could learn from them. And then, of course, going into Afghanistan, it was the Australians under then Lieutenant Colonel Gus Gilmore were the first reinforced, non-American reinforcements that I had come inside our lines there at a place called Rhino. Uh, and out of that, uh, they were under our tactical control. Uh, and there is where Australia lost its first lad killed in action, uh, was under uh, my, that tactical control. And I might add that the last Australian killed in action was when I was the commander of US Central Command. So when America was attacked on 9-11, if you ever wanted to see the value of alliances, uh, there was Australia at our side immediately with very competent, very high-spirited and ethical troops. And you can't ask for more than that. Sir Angus, let me bring you into the conversation and ask you a, the same question from the other end of the telescope, if you like. What do you think Australia gets out of the US alliance and what do we give in return? Well, I'm a, a very strong supporter of the, uh, the, the ANZUS Alliance. I think it's, uh, uh, it underpins our defence policy. Uh, it enables us to gain access to uh, intelligence, logistics and technology, uh, which we probably wouldn't get without being a, an alliance partner. This has enhanced our capability uh, and, of course, uh, we've had access to the most advanced weapons uh, that are available and many other force uh, multipliers. Um, so without, without that sort of uh, alliance, um, we, wouldn't have, um, we wouldn't have as much... Uh, well, I guess let me go another way. We also get interoperability. Um, we exercise with the uh, uh, US forces, uh, we've done an awful lot with the U.S. Marine Corps. They come to Australia regularly uh, on a number of uh, different uh, bases, uh, and uh, they, they basically uh, uh, are the only nation that really gets a chance to uh, routinely uh, mount uh, an exercise um, invasion of Australia. And uh, that relationship uh, at the high end of war fighting has served us incredibly well. We stay in touch with uh, what's happening at the high end uh, and right across the, uh, the spectrum of, uh, of conflict. And we're, we're very, very, uh, I think, privileged uh, because of this access, because of this interoperability, we do not have to spend uh, as much on defence as otherwise would be the case. At the moment, we spend just over 2% 2, 2 uh, of our GDP on defence. Without the alliance, we'd be uh, probably spending double that uh, to have the required uh, insurance policy that we need against the risks that we see uh, around the world at the moment, particularly in our neighbourhood. General Mattis, tell us what, what is the role of the US military in supporting the global uh, rules-based order and what is the role of the State Department? 
How important are diplomats in supporting this order that you described earlier? Yeah, the, uh, I, I think that over the last 25 years, we've gotten this uh, a little cattywampus uh, where we put the military into some circumstances that could probably be better addressed by our diplomats. But our diplomats carry out the most essential function and that is, uh, if America has two fundamental sources of power over its last hundred years, one is the power of inspiration, a uh, little frayed on the edges right now, and one is the power of intimidation. The role of the military is to make sure that the military factors are understood by our diplomats, what we can do, what we can't do, what we recommend, and to keep the diplomats in the driver's seat uh, of our foreign policy. Uh, it's, it's very important, I think, that we remember that America is not out to seize other countries and this sort of thing. And at times we've tried to solve problems using the military that I think perhaps could have been better addressed by using our diplomats. Now there's a role for the military, but this is where we can learn a lot from our allies. The Australian effort to restore order in the Solomons uh, several years ago showed a diplomatically led police reinforced with army troops uh, effort to calm the situation uh, in a part of the world that needed your attention. And so there you see a kind of a, a collaboration with the policy written by the civilians, the military supporting the constable who was put in charge of the restoring the order and a very adroit use of the military. And one of the reasons that we want to maintain a very strong relationship with Australia is that this is one of the countries that can actually teach us how you use all elements of national power and not just default to the military. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a sort of thing that I think takes more training in our schools. I'll be blunt about it. I don't think the way we teach history today is turning out graduates of our universities fully steeped in the role of traditional diplomatic practices. And I think that has been to our, uh, to our uh, I just say it was, has not improved to our credit as we tried to fill the gap uh, using the military. Well, Angus, let me bring you into this question if I can, because I don't think we would say Australia is perfect. And in fact, Australia's spending on defense will shortly pass the magic number of 2% of our GDP However, recent governments of both colours have underfunded the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. What would you say about the importance of the armed forces on the one hand and diplomats in supporting the rules-based order and also furthering Australia's national interests? Well, I, I think uh, on the defence side, um, uh, this government's got it right. Uh, I think their, their approach with the strategic update and the uh, associated uh, force structure um, update uh, is right on the money. Um, the strategy, shape, deter, respond, is the right strategy. I think we need to build up our uh, deterrence capability, and that's brought out in the, uh, uh, the force structure review. Um, but I also think we need to uh, uh, take some of the hollowness out of the, uh, the defence force, and again, uh, some of those issues have been addressed in terms of uh, increasing stock levels of weapons and fuel and so forth. Uh, the other thing I was very pleased about was the fact that uh, there was a, a focus for the first time uh, on what to do about the grey zone. Uh, we've seen what's happened uh, in the South China Sea. We've also seen what's happened in Ukraine and I saw that uh, very close and personal when I was in Ukraine looking after Australia's interests after the shooting down of uh, MH17. Uh, and I think the funding's right too. Um, well over 2%, $575 billion for the next 10 years. Uh, and a large proportion of that, $270 billion, uh, going to capital investment. But I think it's absolutely imperative uh, that we, we also um, build up uh, DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, I, I believe that 
diplomats can achieve, uh, achieve an awful lot, uh, and they may even prevent the need for using uh, military force in a given set of circumstances. Uh, and I think we've, uh, we've taken too many cuts in the uh, diplomatic area. We need more diplomats and not less because uh, the people that I have observed, uh, I mean, Jim just mentioned uh, Solomon Islands. Nick Warner was the uh, diplomat who went out and did that. He's an incredibly capable man and uh, did a wonderful job there uh, in leading that uh, particular uh, campaign. Uh, but diplomats, diplomats are incredibly useful in circumstances uh, short of conflict. Uh, and I just don't think we have enough of them. And when you look at the comparisons between uh, the number of diplomats we have around the world with uh, other similar sized countries, we're, we're at the bottom of the list. Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's disappointing and we need to do something about it. General Mattis, let me ask you about how you dealt with some of these issues during your service as President Trump's Secretary of Defence. Shortly after you became Secretary, you delivered a major address to the 2017 Shangri-La Dialogue. And after you spoke, you may recall I asked a question from the floor in which I described you as the hope of the side. And I asked whether the world might be present at the destruction of the global order the US had helped to establish and maintain since the Second World War. And you may recall you responded by quoting Winston Churchill to me. And you said, bear with us. Once we've exhausted all possible alternatives, the Americans will do the right thing. Now, that comment attracted quite a bit of press coverage because you seem to be implying that America was exhausting all other opportunities, all other avenues. General Mattis, let me put it to you that uh, nearly four years later, it feels like Washington really has exhausted in some cases, all possible alternatives to doing the right thing. Can I ask you, do you think that America has taken a, right to, a wrong turn in the past few years? I think uh, one, you have to go back again in history and remember, uh, Dr. Michael, that after our very uh, nasty argument with King George III, we actually set up a government that would not function smoothly or efficiently. We wanted it to be clunky. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of people are concerned about our commitment to the NATO alliance, probably the most successful military mm -hmm. alliance in history, because it kept the peace. Uh, it was set up to maintain the peace, of course, in the Cold War, protect Western European democracy. And the first time it goes to war is when the United States gets attacked. I mean, you, you, couldn't, have, uh, you couldn't have mistaken the irony of how we, what it was set up for, but what it eventually was used for. But if you say that the, the rules-based order, and let's just take that alliance as a uh, canary in the mine shaft, you'll notice that for all of the president's concerns that the people in Europe are not paying their fair share, they're, they're not paying full freight uh, in most cases, uh, which is not new to President Trump. He's perhaps a little blunter in his uh, comments about it, but you can find this going all the way back to John F. Kennedy's uh, administration. But on the other hand, uh, you see the U.S. Congress looking at the amount of money the president requests for NATO every year and adding money to that budget. We are spending more on NATO year on year for the last several years. So I would say also in the midst of a very raucous time in our democracy, uh, certainly words are important, but actions speak louder than words, even in diplomacy and in security issues. And right now, I think uh, you're seeing the Americans having one of these periods where they go through a lot of uh, a very passionate arguments. And uh, there came a point where it manifested politically uh, I came in, by the way, after uh, first meeting with the president, and we had a very interesting discussion where uh, I disagreed with him on the three questions, uh, positions he put forward to me, and he still hired me. Uh, while in office, uh, I had only three lines of effort. One was to make the U.S. military more lethal. 
One was to broaden and deepen trust with our allies and partners, and one was to reform our business practices. I spent 80% of my time on line of effort number two, working with allies. And so rest assured in the US Congress, there is very strong support for alliances. Uh, in the executive branch, in the State Department, in the institutions, uh, there's strong support. Certainly across America, uh, we find strong support. But at the same time, I, I don't think we have, in our own responsible way, promoted the value of alliances as clearly as Sarangas just explained the value of the, the, the bilateral relationship with America. We have not done that well in America. Uh, fortunately, it's coming out uh, in this election, and I think we're going to see some impact of the, uh, the view of alliances here in the next couple of weeks. Let me ask you, you, you referred earlier to the fact that when I asked you what was the most challenging job you'd had in, in your career, you nominated uh, that period as Defence Secretary. From the outside, it felt like you were trying to hold things together and ensure that the the military remained strong, the alliance system remained strong. How challenging was that when you were operating in a system where, of course, the alliance system, the rules-based order, had a lot of allies within the system, but perhaps um, not in the Oval Office? How much of a challenge was that for you as Defence Secretary? Yeah, I, I, I don't think I... Uh, I know it was uh, out in the news a lot that I was somehow keeping things together against the President. I had a very straightforward relationship with President Trump. I mean, I, I was right up front with him. That's the way I work with my boss, wherever I've been. And, uh, you know, I, I had to deal with tweets. He has an unusual way of, of putting things out at times. Um, but at the same time, I, I generally saw him once a week over a private lunch. And I explained to him very clearly what I was doing. I'd tell him what I'm going to say when I go to NATO next week, this sort of thing. So it wasn't that difficult. But further, I think Michael... Uh, you know, I, 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 went into, uh, I went into NATO in my first conference there, and I explained uh, to the people, many of whom were friends, because I'd been a Supreme Allied Commander for NATO wearing a uniform only a few years before. I, I saw a lot of familiar faces. And I said, you know, it, it's now manifested. I cannot go home and tell the American people that they have to care more about the freedom for your children than you're willing to pay for, than you're willing to sacrifice for. It's now manifested politically. We've got to have this talk. This is no longer World War II devastated Europe. You're, you're on your feet. You're, you're doing well. Uh, and, and I would just tell you that in a number of areas, from India to Sweden and Finland uh, to Mexico, believe it or not, we have very, very warm and trusting uh, very trusted military-to-military uh, -military relations. Uh, not Five Eyes level in terms of what Sarangas rightly called interoperability and intelligence sharing, but uh, nonetheless, very strong relations. So it, it, to me, that was not the difficulty. Uh, it, was, it was something I was very upfront when I was interviewed for the job. I was upfront in my, in my Senate hearings. And it, again, I, I didn't feel like the Lone Ranger on this at all. This is a widespread belief in America, even if it's kind of subdued beneath the, the headlines on the, on the newspapers every day. Thank you, General. I want to ask just one more question about the Trump administration and then come on to China and some other issues. You're, you're very careful when you're asked to reflect on the Trump administration. You did, however, break your vow of silence in a statement you gave to The Atlantic in June um, when you said that Mr. Trump is the first president in your lifetime who does not try to unite the American people. Instead, he tries to divide us. What was it about that moment that led you to speak up? What were you concerned about at that point in time? Well, let me explain that when I left office, it was about the, uh, the treatment of allies. I made it very clear in a in a public letter. Uh, and when you walk out of a, an administration on a matter of principle, Michael, I think knowing that it's still a dangerous world, we have a commander in chief elected by the American people. Uh, that's what the constitution says. Uh, it, the French call it a devoir de reserve, uh, a duty of quiet. Um, you, you don't need to get out and start running your mouth about suddenly you're the font of all wisdom 
and make their job more difficult for the president, the secretary of state, the secretary of defense, this sort of thing. Okay. So I remained silent. Uh, and there did come a point uh, when I thought the military had been uh, put into a position uh, that it shouldn't be. I'm, I'm hard over about the apolitical tradition of the, of the US military. The military exists to protect the experiment that we call America, not to police the people of America. That's a separate issue. So I wanted to make that very clear. And I did so, and I promptly left the uh, public stage at that point. All right, thank you for that, General Mattis. I want to ask both of you about China. I might note we've had one or two problems with uh, Zoom during this interview on your end, General. So, but it looks like it's working now, so we're going to, we're going to plow on. I want, to, I want to come to you first, Sir Angus, on the question of China. And let me ask you about China in the context of the rules-based order. Obviously, an emerging China, a rising China, presents in many ways the most serious challenge to the global order that we've been discussing. Let me start with you, Angus, and then come to General Mattis. Angus, um, what do you think about Australian policy on China at the moment? What do you think about the Australian debate on China? Have we got the balance right both in our public policy and in our public debate? Well, I, I think that right now we're, uh, we're in a difficult position, a challenging position. Uh, our number one alliance partner uh, is at loggerheads with our number one trading partner. Uh, and of course, uh, I think there's been some, um, shall I say, some loose talk um, here, from here in Australia, uh, where uh, we've seen some comments um, basically make the circumstances a, a little worse than they needed to be. So I think our relationship at the moment uh, is at a very low point. Uh, I think the Huawei decision uh, was probably, you know, where it really uh, started. Uh, and this year we've seen a, a number of events. I won't run through them because I think everybody uh, knows. And even, even today there's uh, some debate about whether coal is being uh, restricted, uh, Australian coal exports. But uh, I think we need to um, take a hard look at our relationship with China. I think we need a reset. Uh, we need a circuit breaker uh, because really, uh, if we're going to come out of this uh, recession uh, that we have at the moment because of COVID-19, uh, we need China. Why? Uh, we're integrated into the Chinese economy. Uh, and, you know, fundamentally, uh, we need to be able to work effectively with them uh, and we need to engage them with uh, mutual respect uh, and mutual sensitivity. I think they need to respect our sovereignty as we respect theirs. But constructive relationships with China, both at the bilateral and the multilateral uh, level, are essential to Australia going forward. Uh, they're not going to go away. They're going to get stronger. Uh, they are going to be uh, a force that we have to deal with. So we better work out uh, the best way uh, to work with them. Uh, China's our partner. China is not our enemy. Uh, let's get that very straight. And um, some of the messaging that we've seen um, from uh, elements within Australia, particularly in the, uh, in the parliament, I think has been a little bit ill-disciplined. I'll probably take a hit for saying that. But the fact of the matter is, I think in the sensitive relationship we, we have, um, people should leave it to the prime minister, the foreign minister, the trade minister, the people who are carrying the responsibilities uh, to make statements and messaging about China. Um, in terms of uh, these calls we've heard for more economic uh, sovereignty uh, in our uh, trading relationship, um, yeah, diversif diversification is fine, but it's going to take years to achieve. And the, the fact of the matter is, uh, as John Edwards from the uh, Lowy Institute has said, we're deeply integrated into the East Asian economy, and that's China. Uh, and 
uh, any any talk about uh, instant uh, sovereignty in an economic sense is uh, is more rhetoric than real. So I think we need to hold firm to our values and our interests, uh, and work with like minded uh, in arrangements like the Quad and with ASEAN uh, to construct a new uh, strategic architecture uh, in the region. Now, that's going to be very challenging, uh, but we've got to do something along those lines. Uh, and I was very encouraged uh, by the outcome from the Quad in Tokyo uh, last week. But I might say, finally, um, I was really taken with what our foreign minister said uh, in the press conference after, uh, uh, after the Osman meeting in Washington. She said, we make our own decisions, our own judgments in the Australian national interest and about upholding our security and prosperity and our values. The relationship that we have with China is important and we will have no, and we have no intention of injuring it. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, and I think we need to put a, a high priority on restoring uh, some sort of uh, normality to a very challenging uh, relationship. All right, thank you, Angus. And I note that as you were talking about um, undisciplined statements, there are a couple of dogs barking at your end. Um, General Mattis, I want to bring you in on China, if I can. Tell us a bit about where you think the US relationship with China will go over the next decade. And in particular, how do you think Washington should strike a balance between different imperatives on China? For example, the economic relationship versus criticizing human rights abuses within China versus a more realist emphasis on constraining China's external behavior versus cooperating with China on issues such as climate change, for example. How will the US square this circle? How should it square this circle? Again, uh, Michael, um, I, I would just put it in a historical context. We have not had an adversarial relationship with China. I mean, with Australia and China and the United Nations, we together rolled back fascism in the Pacific uh, at great cost there. And uh, it was only in 1947 to about 1972 that we had the, the adversarial relationship, never before then. And since then, Republican and Democrat administrations have seen China coming of its own as a positive thing. Uh, the, uh, the one point I would make is, as we look forward, uh, which we must do right now, uh, we leaders have a responsibility to define reality. And I only hope that uh, in Beijing, they want the kind of reset and the kind of respect uh, for other nations that uh, we want to see toward China, or Sir, Sir Angus mentioned about China. But as we look forward, uh, this is probably the most significant issue of our time, and specifically between the United States and the PRC. Uh, and I say this because we must find a way that when these two nuclear armed superpowers step on each other's toes, as we will from time to time, the nature of the world, uh, we're going to have to think through how we're going to resolve those differences. I mean, this is a reality. This is what leaders do. And history is not very forgiving of someone saying, well, that's difficult. Okay, it's difficult. That's your duty. Now let's get on with it. Um, I think that we will see a more constructive uh, engagement in the new year. Uh, and perhaps with a more mature strategic framework. Uh, but I think that what we want to do is remember that no one nation dominates in this part of the world. European colonialism came in. It was pushed back in the years of World War II and following. Uh, we, we've seen um, that, uh, the uh, Soviet communism, what they tried to do as far as bringing the ideas in, it was pushed back. And when someone, uh, we're not asking for people to sign up, it's our way or the Chinese way. Uh, but when someone comes out and says there's one belt and one road, uh, my view is with sovereign nations, sovereign nations, uh, there's many belts and many roads. And we should not put people in a position where it's either with 
one belt and one road or they're voted off the island kind of thing. Uh, I think too that we're going to have to preserve the positive pieces that we do have. And there are positive elements from education. Uh, I mean, there's been some mucking around there too with certain Confucius societies and all, but overall the education doors, I think are a positive part of the relationship. Australia with China and the United States with China. I think too, if we can uh, look at the aspects of the economics where it's reciprocal, and if they want customer facing relationships and investments in our country, then we should have the same for our businesses in their country. Uh, further, I think we need to reframe the narrative, which I think is also what uh, Sir Angus was saying there. Uh, and that means a return uh, to what I would call structured strategic dialogues. Right now, Michael, I'm concerned we talk about uh, North Korea's nukes, or we talk about the Senkaku Islands, or the South China Sea, or Hong Kong, or the Uyghurs, but there's not the overarching uh, strategic discussions about common ground and uncommon ground, and the priorities we place. The kind of thing we had, for example, with Moscow and Washington, D.C., even during some tough times that the Reagan administration, for example, uh, dealt with uh, as we arranged to get Jews out of Russia and able to immigrate to Israel. In the midst of the Cold War, we were able to do that. And I think too, uh, we're going to have to prioritize multilateral engagements. And there, uh, Sir Angus mentioned the Quad. Uh, I just think the Quad helps us to uh, integrate and yet separate where necessary so that we can have, we, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And my last question, my, I, but I don't, I don't understand right now why China is doing much of what it's doing. Uh, they come to America and the president said, we will not uh, militarize the Spratly Islands and they militarize the Spratly. Uh, they asked for our help in the eighties about the return of Hong Kong it was the right thing to do. They said one country, two systems. They have violated that. Uh, we had reduced our sales of arms to Taiwan over the years uh, on the assumption it would be a peaceful reconciliation. And we're not seeing that now. Uh, you look on the Indian border. I don't know what is causing President Xi, no one else matters in the country. I don't know what is causing President Xi right now uh, to go with wolf diplomacy and the cyber efforts against Australia, the banning of beef from certain Australian abattoirs. Uh, when you put this together, uh, there's something driving this, a vulnerability somewhere that I don't understand. And part of getting this relationship back on track is understanding each other. And right now, uh, China's uh, doing some things that makes that problematic. General Mattis, I want to ask you about another cheery topic, and that is coronavirus. First, let me say how shocked and saddened Australians have been about the toll that coronavirus has taken on your country, now 210,000 dead and counting. That's more than your losses in World War I, 9-11 and Vietnam combined, if, I, if I'm correct. We're used to seeing the United States as the epicentre of global power, not as the epicentre of global disease. Has COVID shown up America's frailties, do you think? Yeah, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges we have is we are the United States and an awful lot of power is in our states. Uh, but we have not handled the COVID situation well. That, that, that is no, no ground for an excuse. The bottom line is uh, we have seen a response to disease politicized in an unfortunate way, and the cost is real. Any crisis, and certainly a crisis against a nasty little bugger like uh, COVID-19, is a race between knowledge and time. And it caught us all flat-footed. Uh, China, I think, mishandled some things early on. Uh, I think Australia was quite right to say we need to look at this so we don't do it again. It's unfortunate that China took that as a reason to take retribution, economic retribution on uh, Australia. But I think that what we have to look at here is the 
democracies, New Zealand, uh, I would say Australia, uh, not, not perfect, I'm not saying that, but well handled, Taiwan, uh, Republic of Korea. But it's interesting too to see that countries that had recently been through a bad hit with SARS, there's nothing like uh, something in the human experience, a disaster to really get you ready for the next one. And we got lucky. And lucky on one did not put us in a position, I think, where lessons learned and processes and procedures rehearsed put us at the top of our game. And we've paid a, we've paid a bloody awful price for it is the bottom line. There's no dressing it up. All right. Um, now I'm gonna take a few questions from the audience or rather we collected some questions before uh, the event began and I wanna put a couple of them to, um, to both of you. I'm gonna start with you if you don't mind, Sir Angus. Can I ask you, we were talking about China before and, and General Mattis was putting some of the onus back on Beijing. We have a question from Malcolm Garcia and he asks, what can the world do to influence Xi Jinping? What do you think, Angus? What can the world, what can Australia do to influence Chinese thinking on some of these questions? I, mean, I think that's very, uh, very challenging. Um, you're dealing with a, uh, an authoritarian uh, state in, in China um, the president of China is also the, uh, uh, the leader of the, uh, the Communist Party in China. Uh, and he holds immense power. Um, in November of uh, 2017, uh, he went out with a very long statement which uh, suggested that he was, uh, he was stronger uh, than any uh, of his predecessors in terms of uh, his leadership uh, of the Communist Party and of course of China. So influencing China I think is, uh, is a great challenge, but uh, I believe, uh, I do believe we've got a, this is where uh, diplomats come in. Um, I think the diplomats have to start working to prepare the way for the politicians to uh, engage and um, and I think that uh, at the political level, uh, that's probably the way to do it. More broadly, engaging the, uh, uh, the Chinese people. Uh, well, uh, a lot of uh, Chinese, uh, uh, young Chinese come to uh, Western universities. Uh, they get a good education and they get exposure to uh, what happens in the, uh, uh, the democratic world. Uh, they go back to China and uh, they, uh, they get involved in business and so on. So I think there's probably uh, a lot of people in China who are well disposed uh, to, the, uh, to the Western world. Uh, and uh, I think we should uh, try and, uh, and build on uh, that, that goodwill that's out there. Uh, but it's very challenging because of the limitations of uh, working with a, uh, uh, a state that has essentially uh, closed, closed doors to any suggestion that uh, uh, we might be trying to influence their young people or we might be trying to influence their community. Uh, I think we just, the way we were going in 2014 when I think the, uh, the relationship uh, hit a high point, seemed to me that we were headed in a really good, uh, uh, a very good direction. Things were becoming more open. We were working together on things like MH370. Uh, uh, we signed a trade, uh, free trade arrangement, and uh, we even uh, signed off on a strategic partnership with China. But since then, things have become much tighter. And uh, Jim said he's not quite sure why, uh, well, I guess I'm not quite sure why, because things seem to be going in a reasonable direction, but they changed uh, 2014, after 2014. And I think it's more than uh, Huawei. I think there are other things that have changed it, and I'm not sure what those other things are. All right, General Mattis, I'm going to ask you a question. I might just say for our live viewers, we've had some problems with the video from General Mattis, but the audio is fine. So. If you're wondering why you're seeing a lot of shots of me, of my face, when you're hearing General Mattis speaking, I assure you it's not vanity on my part. Um, it's, it's just because we're having some video problems. But we're going to plough on 
uh, like a good uh, Australian infantryman or a US Marine, General Mattis. Let me ask you, I have a question from my chairman, Sir Frank Lowy, who's in Tel Aviv at the moment. Sir Frank asks, in relation to the Middle East, what has the Trump administration got right and what has it got wrong? Yeah, I think uh, right now, uh, in answer to Frank's question, you take a look at this opening between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we are seeing the seeds of a, of a deeper peace. Uh, it, it still concerns me that Iran is doing what it's doing uh, there. I'm not trying to uh, ignore that reality and the amount of support they are giving from uh, Lebanese Hezbollah in Lebanon uh, to the Syrian Assad regime and some of their militias acting contrary to the best interest of the Iraqi people, for example, uh, and all the way down to Yemen. But as you see this uh, warming trend between the Arab states now joining Egypt and Jordan in terms of relations with Israel, with United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, I think you're seeing some of the uh, some of the groundwork taking firm hold that will reduce a lot of the tensions and what has kept the Middle East at a boil. At the same time, uh, there are uh, worrisome issues out of Turkey uh, right now, and certainly the situation in Syria with Iran's continued help and Russia's blocking the UN from really playing a, a good role to mediate that uh, are, are reason for a lot of concern. But I think within the realm of what the, the, uh, the administration has done, uh, I think that uh, the most important thing is that we're seeing this relaxation of tensions and coming out into the open, something that was only happening very quietly for quite some time. There, there have been warming trends but in the Middle East, I learned, don't, don't believe anything that's not in public. Uh, it's got to get in public, and it finally has gotten there. So I would really highlight that as what has been gotten right. All right. I want to ask both of you briefly about climate change, if I can, as a threat to the international order. Uh, General Mattis, perhaps you first. Obviously, the US Marines special in, specialize in traditional security threats. Uh, climate change is, is a non-traditional one. But, but how real a problem is that? How much of a threat is that to our national interests and to the order from which we've benefited so much? Uh, you know, I, I've ceased trying to convince uh, the disbelievers in climate change that there's climate change. Uh, the way I would handle it uh, when I was Secretary of Defense, I'd simply say, okay, uh, I don't know how come, but all the ice has gone away from a certain place and I've got to be concerned with it. So just bear with me. As I deal with it, because what I eventually hit on uh, in order to try to change the, the thinking there was most of you who drove to this meeting or wherever you're at have car insurance. It's not because you expect to have a car accident tonight. It's in case something goes wrong. So shouldn't we at least have a insurance policy if climate change is real? For me, it's real. It's quantifiable. It's science. And I have no doubt about it. Matter of fact, in 2008, as the, uh, as the commander of US Joint Forces Command, we wrote down the 10 top drivers for the next decade for uh, national security problems. And one of them was, uh, we announced in 2008, uh, was climate change, the warming trend, the desertification, all those, those kind of things. I think it is an area that in one way, allows us all to work together and lose a lot of the adversarial relations we may have on a number of other issues for the good of all mankind. But it's going to take political leadership, and that's by everyone, including the United States, uh, is the bottom line. I consider it very serious. I don't think it's something we can get to in 10 or 20 years. I think you need to start working the insurance policy with urgency yesterday. All right. And Angus, just briefly on climate change as a security threat, if you wouldn't mind. Look, I think climate change is real. Um, I, I recently became the chair of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and uh, inflows into the uh, basin have been reducing steadily over the years. Uh, 
a 20% 20, 20 reduction at least. And if you have a look at uh, the droughts over the years, uh, six droughts in the last 20 years, uh, the 20 years before that, only one drought, the 20 years before that, only one drought. So uh, in uh, key parts of Australia, in the food bowl of Australia, uh, we're seeing the, uh, the climate change uh, in an adverse way. And those sorts of events are happening all over the world. And uh, I think uh, it, it, will, it will have a security uh, dimension to it. Uh, I don't know how food production, for example, with a vast, you know, a growing population, a huge population growth predicted uh, through the, uh, the next uh, 20, 20, 30 years. Uh, I'm not sure about food supply. I think food security is uh, an associated issue, uh, which is going to become uh, very prominent and uh, very important. So climate change in itself uh, is, uh, is real. It's what comes out of the climate change. Uh, I think there'll be issues with food security. Uh, and if we look at the, uh, the rising temperature, uh, it don't, doesn't just have a, uh, an effect uh, over the land uh, in places like uh, Eastern Australia. We look out into the Pacific, some of those little nations out there uh, have a real concern about a rise uh, in the sea level. And there's got to be a security concern about that as well. So I agree with Jim, we've got to, uh, we've got to get um, the world community together uh, and climate change is something uh, that we can put on the table and be guided by uh, uh, the science and uh, basically decide uh, how we're going to handle uh, what is arguably uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, that we face into okay. the future. General Mattis, we've got time for one more question. I'm going to ask you about the 2020 election. I'm not going to ask you to endorse a candidate, although, of course, if you want to make news for the Lowy Institute, you're very welcome to do so. But let me ask you this. Having served a number of US presidents, what do you think is the most important quality for the commander in chief? In your memoir, Call Sign Chaos, you said that the two qualities you look for when you're looking to leaders in the US Marines were initiative and assertiveness. When you're in the, the voting box, what do you look for? What will you look for on November the 3rd in your commander in chief? Yeah, I, I, I will decline your offer, uh, Dr. Michael, to endorse a candidate. I, my, my thoughts are that retired generals uh, need to retire their tongues during election season uh, in keeping with the, the, uh, in keeping with the apolitical uh, tradition of democracies, militaries uh, from, uh, from Australia to the Americas. Uh, but I would just say that uh, the, what I would look for most in, in a leader is competence and compassion. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that to me is the character piece of them. I, I would look to the character uh, and, and competence as a leader and compassion, uh, empathy uh, with their people, all their people. As Harry Truman put it, one of our former presidents, he's also the president of those who did not vote for him. So I, I'd look for character, uh, Michael. And thanks so much for having me, Michael. This is more fun than waterboarding, you know, training. You know, it's uh, you two shooting <laughs> questions at me. Thank you. Well, thank you, General Jim Mattis and Sir Angus Houston for having me, um, for having us in your homes today. It's been a fascinating conversation. I know you won't j blame me, General Mattis, for trying to push you a little bit on newsworthy topics. Thank you for teaching us or teaching me a new word today, and that is cattywampus. I still don't know what that is, but I'm going to look that I'm going to look that up uh, later. So, so I've learned a, a new word from a US Marine today. So thank you very much. It's been an honor, truthfully, for me to speak to two individuals who've served their countries with such distinction. So thank you. Thank you for pressing on despite Zoom difficulties. We really appreciated it. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us for this Lowy Institute live event. Please keep an eye out for the Lowy Institute's work. I mentioned earlier our timeline on the rules-based order. Last week, we published an analysis by non-resident fellow Dr. Tom Wright on American global leadership and the November election. 
And let me also give a plug to my podcast, The Director's Chair. In recent episodes, I've interviewed Jake Sullivan and Nick Burns, who've both endorsed Joe Biden. And in the next episode, I'll speak to the leading Republican foreign policy figure, Steve Hadley, who was National Security Advisor to George W. Bush. In the meantime, from everyone at the Lowy Institute, thank you for joining us today and stay safe and well.